Good afternoon, friends and neighbors. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. My name is Melissa Sheehan, and on behalf of 305 West End Assisted Living, my co-hosts, Michelle Arnault, Senior Director of PSS Circle of Care, and Meredith Wong, Manager, Caring Kinds Connect to Culture, we are delighted to welcome you to our second annual Artful Aging Fair. Um, during, due to our current times, as you undoubtedly may have noticed, we are gathering today virtually. For this reason, uh, we've separated our afternoon today into two sessions. The first being from 1 until about 2 p.m. And the second, it will begin at three until about four. In our intermission, as it were, uh, we invite you to join our hosts, uh, the three of us and some of our organizations for some chat and a little um, informal meet and greet. Uh, we're incredibly grateful to the diverse cultural organizations from all across New York City who so generously agreed to join us today to share and celebrate. In our unprecedented times, the healing power of the arts is more vital than ever for older adults, people with Alzheimer's disease and other related dementias and their care partners. The wonderful programs that these organizations continue to provide to engage, enrich, and empower the lives of older adults and their care partners in New York City and beyond are more vital than ever. Prepare yourselves to be excited and inspired by their amazing talent and perseverance. Before I hand this over to Meredith Wong, I'd just like to really thank Caring Kinds Connect to Culture and PSS Circle of Care and Michelle Arnault for their incredible dedication and all of the time that they've taken in hosting the event. You guys are simply the best. Have a great Meredith. Hi, thanks, Melissa, and welcome, everyone. This is such a great event, and I'm so glad that we were able to um, transfer it onto, the, onto your computer, right straight into your homes. Uh, we have a great lineup of organizations who are um, very grateful and appreciative of everyone's participation in this program and in their programs. Um, of our lineup today, as Melissa mentioned, we have it broken up into two sessions. Um, the flow of the schedule will be, uh, we're going to start off with some music from Concerts in Motion. Uh, and then that will be followed by uh, presentations from the American Folk Art Museum, the Orpheus Chamber Orchestra, the Intrepid uh, Sierra and Space Memorial Museum, the Jewish Museum, and we'll finish up that session with the Metropolitan Museum of Art. We'll take a short uh, hour long breaks during which you can um, ask us questions. We're gonna do each do um, a short presentation uh, from each of our uh, co-hosts from Circle PSS Circle of Care 305 and Caring Kind. And then we're going to have our second session um, that will start off at about three o'clock with Lincoln Center, the Museum of Chinese in Americas, uh, Burko Music Therapy, and we'll finish up with the Rubin Museum. I do want to, um, to ask if you are planning to come to the Rubin Museum session uh, towards the end of the day, um, they invite you to participate in a brief uh, paper folding activity for which you'll need a square piece of paper. Um, they've, uh, I think they're going to use eight by eight. So without uh, delaying any further, I want to introduce Drew Barnes from Concerts in Motion. Thanks very much, Drew. Thank you, Meredith. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad to be here today representing Concerts in Motion. My name is Drew and I am a licensed social worker. And for those of you who are not familiar with Concerts in Motion, we have been in existence as a nonprofit for a little over 10 years. And we provide live music to uh, typically, we say the city's most vulnerable populations, um, but 
now due to current circumstances we are able to reach uh, recipients countrywide worldwide um, that is maybe the only silver lining of current circumstances but we will take it and um, we really tailor our concerts to the needs and the requests of our recipients and we have almost every genre under the sun that anyone could request from us. We are currently providing all of our concerts through Zoom, and these are live concerts. We have a weekly schedule, and we are providing concerts Monday through Friday. We have 14 concerts weekly. And that includes a youth program where student musicians are performing as well. And a really beautiful component of what we provide is that, yes, we are um, providing a full spectrum uh, and immersive concert experience, but we also have a um, we have about four intermissions in each concert. And that is where we welcome everyone to unmute themselves and uh, they speak to us about the music, um, memories that have come up for them during the concert. They ask the musicians questions. It's such a lovely way to, and, and you know, um, there's no pressure involved in this way to help alleviate some isolation um, that your clients may be facing. And currently um, we are able to provide these weekly concerts free of charge. So with that being said, um, we really do hope that you will consider providing information about our organization to your clients. And I'm going to put my email address in the chat box. And I welcome any um, questions. If any of you would ever like to join a concert to experience it firsthand, just let me know. Um, like I said, I'm a social worker myself, and um, I'm sure many of you are or work with social workers and know how much is on all of your plates. And so my goal is to just make it as seamless as possible for you to be able to relay information to your clients um, or family members for that matter. Um, and keep in mind, it's not only limited to New York City right now. And uh, with that being said, we have two short videos that uh, will be played for you. One is um, sort of what was <laughs> um, last year and seeing live concerts. And one is what is our virtual series and how beautifully that has bloomed over the past few months. So I welcome you to enjoy these two videos. Thank you so much. Thank you. themselves. My mom has loved music since childhood. She first was introduced to the piano at about uh, nine or ten years old and she I remember her telling me stories as a child that that was her passion. I was so excited to learn of the program I couldn't wait for it to begin. You can tell that it's created a tie for them into something that is a buoy. It kind of keeps them going from visit to visit. For me it's such a great experience and relive those memories of her really enjoying music. It makes her happy and in turn, it makes me happy. NOC stands for Natural Occurring Retirement Community. Uh, elder people, they've been working so hard for all their life and now they are kind of like a lot of homes. The music can actually bring out their wellness to deliver the goodness to their mind. I think that's something really unspeakable to them. Well, I think music is a language where everyone understands. Even though I, sometimes I cannot communicate with them, but I think through music I can touch their hearts and 
so warm. I think New York is a place where you forget where you are. And coming to Chinatown brings me home. It's an experience not just of listening to music, but of communicating and having a connection with someone who is performing, yes, but also reaching out in a very personal way. We're right in the heart of El Barrio, Manhattan's uh, Latino neighborhood. It's like the best reward for me when people get up dancing and they're singing along and they're smiling and they're laughing and they're making connections with us and between each other. To me, that's the best reward that I could hope for. I think what our musicians see is that comfort in connecting to something that this person may have grown up listening to. And that is a really joyous and powerful experience. When the concert's in motion is here, all the patients are smiling, they're clapping their hands, they're tapping their feet. It's, it's something they have in common that they realize, you know, that they really all enjoy this together. It helps us because it takes our mind off our own struggles that we're actually going through at that time. I have PTSD, so it gets my mind somewhere to wander. I don't like crowds, but in the music, the crowd doesn't seem like a crowd. See, Emily? And it's just a big, big gap. One of the things that I've seen with the young people who perform is an ability to sort of step outside of themselves. It gives you all of a sudden empathy in a dimension that they maybe never have experienced before. So I think one side is what you give, but the other side is what you get out of it. It's a nice way to take a breath and not be in a rush to go anywhere or to be anywhere. When they're singing and they're about life and things like that, it hits me right in here. I've been around a while and it's uh, it really makes me review my life. I have so much faith in the kids today. So many kids who are artistic, sensitive, and caring. It looks good for the future, it really does. When it's a good fit, I think it's just magical because it, it gives the, the performer, the student, an opportunity to take their, their time and apply it in a way where they can see literally in that minute the impact that it's had. It's, there's nothing abstract about it. They've learned and mastered a language that's universal and meaningful and has the power to connect in a very human way. Concerts in Motion brings live by professionals, played by young people, to isolated individuals and groups who can't get to concert halls themselves. My mom has loved music since childhood. Oh. Oh, okay. Hi. Hi. Hi, everybody. There we go. You live before me here on behalf of Concerts in Motion. Welcome to the Concerts in Motion virtual visiting to visit your program. Our way of being able to share music with all of you. We're here for the music, right? So let's start. And then in between pieces, we'll open it up so you can ask questions and make comments. If I could play any song you have a request for, that'd be great. Oh, that's a good one to play for you guys. And we'd love to hear from you. <laughs> <laughs> Join us. Join us. Join us. Join us. Присоединяйтесь к нам. Мы рады играть для вас. Lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you all so much for uh, watching these videos with us. And uh, we hope that it gave you a little bit of a glimpse of what we have to offer. And I'm going to put my email address in the chat right now. And feel free to take a look at our website, concertsinmotion.org, if you would like to. And thank you all. Thanks for having me, 305. And I'll see you soon, I hope.
All right, should I get myself going here? All right. So uh, my name is Elizabeth Gronke, and I, oh, I think the slide before that should have had my name and the, oh, whatever. If this is the first slide, that's fine. All right, my name is Elizabeth Gronke. I work at the American Folk Art Museum. And the first question, oops, and I wanna set my timer so that I don't take up too much time with this presentation because we all have to get our chance. Um, uh, it's very exciting to be here. Let me first say that I, I really had a fun time at last year's Artful Aging Fair and wondered what would happen this year. Um, so uh, this, is, this is a great solution and I'm so thrilled to be invited and uh, virtually to meet all of you through this, through the, the way, however we can. So onward. So the American Folk Art Museum is located on the Upper West Side on Lincoln, um, on Columbus Avenue between 65th and 66th Street. I don't know if you've ever visited, but I highly, highly recommend it if you get a chance. It's small, it's free, it's lovely. There's always an interesting exhibition going on and um, it's a very welcoming place. Right now we're open um, by timed appointment. So that would be just something to keep in mind if you want to go, you should go on the website to make sure to get your timed entry ticket, even though it's free, it's, it's still a ticket. So next slide, please. So I also like to ask people um, when I'm presenting to anybody, what is folk art? And I, I know we're not, we're not exactly doing a, a Q and A at this point, most everybody's muted, which probably works best for this format, but some of the answers I've gotten are, are things like art for the people, by the people, um, self-taught art is another thing I've heard people say. All of these are true. Um, sometimes it's like uh, considered artwork that's it's a little bit um, sort of on the edge of, of, of what's popular. Um, and all of it's true. The longer I've worked at the museum, the more I found out how broad the definition of folk art can be. Lots of people use self-taught art as the definition, but I don't, I don't always go for that. For example, um, see the, the, the circular form in the middle, that's, that's actually cut out of paper. It's like, you know, when you fold paper to make a, um, a snowflake and you cut out and you unfold it and it looks like a snowflake, that's the same process. And it's, it's as intricate as lace. And you can be sure that whoever made that didn't invent it himself. <laughs> he it was a male artist who did this. He learned it from somebody. It was a, it was a craft uh, that he learned. Now the abstract painting on the far left was a self-taught artist and um, was very clever and inventive and went from photography to painting to sculpture throughout his life. He was always trying new things on his own. And I think that there's something special about folk art and all of its ways of defining itself that makes it a little bit approachable. People who maybe didn't start making art till much later in life have become well-known folk artists. And the fact that we as art viewers can just try it, just like the artists we're looking at did. They just tried it out. And um, we're a little bit uh, you know, set free from, from what art is supposed to be. So um, that's why I enjoy uh, looking at folk art and learning more about it. Next slide, please. So we have this wonderful program that I, I'm the access educator for. It's called Folk Art Reflections. And for many years, it was an, a program that we had in the museum galleries. And it was twice a month um, or once a month, sometimes twice a month. And we would invite people in to enjoy the, the space and have, be led by an art educator to look at maybe a few pieces, have a discussion, maybe even a hands-on art project. So of course, now we've translated that into Zoom. So once a month, um, I'm leading a public program about whatever theme I've chosen. Uh, the upcoming one, which you'll see a screenshot for is 
Uh, it's coming up on August, I'm sorry, November 5th, next week, a week from today, you're all invited. Uh, so please email me if you're interested. I will, I will follow Drew's lead and put my email in the chat after this. Um, the next one's going to be all about artwork from the museum's collection that is shop sign art. So like sculptures that were put out in front of stores and intricate signs that were put in front of stores and beautiful paintings that were made long ago to sell their wares. So that's, that's what the theme is going to be next week. So that's always on offer and you can find out about this is a, a screenshot from our website. That's something you can always look up to see what's coming up next. Next slide, please. We also, as part of Folk Art Reflections before COVID, unfortunately, we haven't been able to do this lately, but we will go back to it someday. We do offsite sessions. So for those of you who are um, running day programs or residences, um, I would love to talk to you about what we can bring to you because I understand very well how hard it is to get a group of really wonderful people out into a museum. So we can bring the museum to you. And what I do is I also come up with a theme. I come up with a few artworks to talk about and look at together. And then we always do a hands-on project. And I usually like to try to bring a touch object, like you could see an image of me there um, holding a quilt that we were able to look at and let everybody touch. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice to do again? So someday we'll be able to do that again. So we can look forward to that. Next slide, please. Another part of Folk Art Reflections are music series. Uh, it's about one, um, one concert per uh, exhibition. So that's about three a year. And this, this photo is showing this fabulous event that we had that was centered around the idea of quilts because we had a quilt exhibition up. So I hi we hired this very talented uh, vocal artist who led us in a song circle. And we just filled that museum space with, with our voices and it was fantastic. So since it's gotta be on Zoom now, we've done our best to, to make it as fun on Zoom and uh, yeah, we have one coming up soon with Orpheus Chamber Orchestra that will also be on our website that you can, you can look up and please email me to register for. Next slide, please. And this is my final slide. Um, here you see my email address, a beautiful quilt that I happen to love that's made entirely of silk um, and a little pitch um, in the middle there, it says, watch our video visits on YouTube. All you have to do is go onto YouTube and type in Folk Art Reflections. That's the name of our program. And I've made 12 videos um, since COVID started so that you can take a little piece of the Folk Art Museum in bite-sized pieces. The videos are only about um, eh, 12 to 15 minutes long. And I introduce a few pieces of art, give a few things to think about, hopefully talk about, and uh, and we we uh, I also offer something to do at the end of this each session. So I encourage you to look at that um, at your convenience, and please be in touch with me if you have ideas of ways you'd like to bring the Folk Art Museum into your organization. Let me know, and if you're an individual email me, I'd be happy to talk to you about what, what would be best for you and the person that you care for. So thank you for joining and thank you for inviting me today. I'll put my email in the chat right now. Hi, thanks Elizabeth. I'm, I'm going to insert myself briefly here just to say um, I was very remiss in um, 
not mentioning that we have Sing for Your Seniors to close us out today um, with some songs and music. So please forgive me for, uh, <laughs> for neglecting to mention that, but I think it'll be a nice way to end our afternoon. Um, so now we're going to welcome uh, Orpheus Chamber Orchestra. Hi, Angela. Hi, thank you, Meredith. Hi, everyone. My name is Angela Gehring, and I'm the Director of Finance and Community Engagement for Orpheus Chamber Orchestra. And I'm so glad to be here today with one of our artistic directors and violist Dana Kelly to tell you more about our Orpheus Reflections program. Um, we are a chamber orchestra based in New York City and uh, Orpheus Reflections is one of our community engagement programs that we began about two years ago. And since it's become such an integral part of our orchestra and we've seen firsthand the powerful impact that our music can have and all music can have on people living with Alzheimer's disease, other forms of dementia and their caregivers. Our regular in-person programs would include bringing small chamber groups such as trios and include performances of both classical repertoire and popular tunes such as Moon River, or What a Wonderful World, and always encouraging the participants to sing along if they're to the songs. Our musicians would also always share stories and background about themselves and the pieces that they would play. And after performances, they would uh, mingle with the participants and answer any questions they may have. If you're interested in seeing a bit more about what our program was like pre-COVID, um, visit the link for our website shown on the slide and you can watch a video there. Of course, with everyone, when the pandemic first broke out, we really had to rethink um, everything that we did, including our reflections program. And we were just determined to make sure that we were able to bring this program online. Um, thankfully, due to the support um, of some of our partners in collaboration, we were able to start offering this program virtu virtually in May over Zoom. Um, we really learned very quickly that there's definitely some limitations within Zoom, um, one of them being the fact that due to delay and some techno technological limitations, you can't have multiple people playing at the same time. Um, so our Zoom performances are a bit different. Uh, we have our musicians joining, um, each from their homes, and they would share solo performances from their homes of classical pieces. Uh, we even learned how we could do a sing-along portion of our program over Zoom. Um, after working with the wonderful choir for people living with dementia and their family care partners, the Unforgettables Chorus. Well, it's been really interesting to see um, what we do is we have everyone on mute um, and we have our musicians play through the melody of a popular tune. And either if we're working with the Unforgettables Chorus, we have their conductor lead a sing along and sometimes even our musicians did as well. Um, we have everyone set to gallery view on Zoom. So even though you aren't able to hear everyone singing, it's been really wonderful to see everyone singing from home and moving to the music together. Um, our sessions still close online with a chance where we bring everyone off mute so that people can uh, socialize and ask our musicians questions. And then in addition to our Zoom programs, uh, during the lockdown, our musicians made some lovely recordings of performances from their homes, which we created into a reflections playlist that we put up on YouTube. Uh, you can also find the link for this playlist on the slide. And again, I'll add it to the chat um, at the end of this. Um, and it's just, I really hope that you go and watch and see the you know, beautiful music that our musicians put together. Um, if you're interested in uh, working with us, we bring our music directly to organizations, uh, assisted living facilities. Uh, please contact me. My email is on the slide. I'll put it in the chat as well. Um, and I'd love to now pass it off to my colleague, Dana, and she's going to tell us a little bit about her experience with our program and give you all a short performance. Thank you, Angela. Hi, everyone. My name is Dana Kelly. And as Angela mentioned, I'm one of the artistic directors of the Orpheus Chamber Orchestra. I'm also a violist. And I've had the pleasure of doing many reflections programs, both in person when we were able to over the years and a few of these virtual ones in the past few months. Um, I know all the musicians in the orchestra love doing these programs because as performers, we often don't get the chance to speak to our audience members after concerts. 
And when we're playing in these settings, especially with adults with Alzheimer's and dementia, it's so great to see how they open up and their faces lighten up and um, how many questions and comments they have as we, as we go through our program. Um, it's really fun to talk to them about experiences they've had with music in their lives over the years. Um, a surprising number of them tell us that they are former musicians, they used to sing or play piano, and um, getting to speak to them about how music has been a huge part of their lives is really special to us and to them. Um, also, I would say in this virtual world, um, as Angela mentioned, unfortunately, the Orpheus musicians can't play together, but um, in our solo performances, it's been really fun to see how everyone has chosen their repertoire um, to share in these virtual refle reflections programs. And I think if you click on the uh, reflections playlist list, um, you'll see just how varied the choices are that our musicians have made and how personal the choices are. Some of us have played Baroque music, others like to play um, some Motown music. Some people have been able to make uh, recordings with their family members. So it's a really great variety of, of music. And um, I think it's been really wonderful to still be able to share um, even though we're in this virtual setting. So I wanted to play for you um, two movements from uh, the first box suite for solo cello. These are two dance movements. The first is a courant and the second is a saraban.
Thank you very much. Thanks everyone and thank you, Dana, that was beautiful. All right, um, I guess I'll start. All right, that was really beautiful and really wonderful. So I'm glad that I got to hear that. Um, so hi everyone, uh, my name is Charlotte and I work at the Intrepid Sea, Air and Space Museum, um, which is pictured here. And I am joined by my colleague Ife, who um, will also be speaking today. And oh, if you could go back, oh, thank you. Um, so once again, my name is Charlotte. I apologize if you can hear the siren outside my window. Um, and I'm really thrilled to be here today. Um, as I mentioned, I work at the Intrepid Museum, which is actually in this photograph here. Um, as you may see, our museum is a little different from most other museums, especially um, in and around New York City, in that we are located um, based on the former aircraft carrier Intrepid. And so it's a ship that's over 900 feet long, floating in the Hudson River. Um, although I can, I can assure you, it does not go anywhere. Um, it, is, it is safely docked um, at Pier 86. So we're at West 46th Street and 12th Avenue. Um, and we actually just recently, about a month ago, reopened to the public and we're open Wednesday, to, Wednesday through Sunday. Um, and as with the Folk Art Museum, we require advanced ticketing, um, but we hope that you'll come and visit us at some point um, for yourself or with a loved one. Um, we're really happy to be open. And um, we tell the story of the over 50,000 people who served on Intrepid during its history, um, which, is, which is really meaningful and powerful to us. And we also have a submarine from the Cold War and the Space Shuttle Orbiter Enterprise. So we have a lot of, of stories that we can share and a lot to, to bring people to. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Um, and Ife just put our website in the chat, so please do check that out. Um, so today um, I'll be speaking about our programs for individuals with dementia and their care partners. Um, and then Ife will speak about the programs that we do specifically for, for groups um, and organizations, our, our art series. And so this program, The Stories Within, we've been doing for a number of years. Um, I'm probably seven, eight years at this point, um, if not longer. And it's a program that before uh, the pandemic, as with everyone else, we were holding these in person at the museum. And we would hold these in the fall and spring uh, monthly. We did that because the weather is a little bit nicer. So we could be a little bit more comfortable um, going outside up onto the flight deck. Um, and it was easier to get to our museum. And every session was a different topic. And so these could explore, um, like in the image on the left, um, is a program that we've done called Good Morning Intrepid, which is all about the routine um, that the sailors would go through as they're getting ready in the morning. And in this picture, um, we have our educator, Ellen, um, joined by a former crew member, Tony Franchica, who actually served on board Intrepid, um, and our participants. And we're all singing Here Comes the Sun as a way of kind of grounding us in the time period that Intrepid served, um, this, at this point the 1960s, because Intrepid served from 43 to 74, um, singing that to get started um, with the day and then kind of going through the process. We actually went down to um, the eating area that the sailors had. Um, we smelled coffee and spices um, that you might have, you know, maple sugar that you would have with your pancakes in the morning. So things to really connect to that. Um, we've also done programs um, like the one on the right, where we had someone from our aircraft restoration team, the team of people who take care of the aircraft, the airplanes and helicopters in our collection. Um, and here, two of our regular participants are actually feeling parts that they would have been using um, to make a, a repair on the plane. And they actually tried out some riveting. Um, a lot of these programs, we include storytelling and opportunities to make connections with each other and with the museum um, and very multi-sensory. Um, we'll have music from the time period, or we'll have spices and, 
We've made smell jars to go along with the holidays. We've taken photos of ourselves and made frames for them around the museum while looking at photography from the collection. Um, and so these are really fun and immersive. Now, of course, um, we're not able to do these programs in person right now. So we've switched to moving these online over Zoom, very similar to this. Um, and they are still free with advanced registration. Um, and these programs, when they're online, we still, you know, we often invite a former crew member to come and share stories. So we did a program about um, Intrepid's connection to space travel and a crew member, John Oliveira, who actually served on Intrepid when they picked up an astronaut was actually there and he was able to share some of his story. Um, we've done programs on fun and games. So about the way that sailors on the ship would have fun and the music they would listen to. And we could play music and watch footage of an actual concert that took place on Intrepid during World War II. Um, and so trying to, to maintain some of those connections. Um, if you go to the next slide. Um, I'll just say that for our, we have one more program in our fall series for Stories Within. It's next Thursday, so a week from today. And to register, um, I'll show you on the next slide, but you just email access at intrepidmuseum.org and we'd be happy to register you um, and your loved ones. The other series we have coming up are our winter tea dances. We're really excited about these. Um, this photo is actually from a tea dance, so an afternoon dance that took place on Intrepid. Um, and so you have all the sailors in their white uniforms um, with the, some local women who came on to dance with them. Um, and so these will be taking place the second Wednesday of December, January, and February. Um, and they're facilitated by Rhythm Break Cares. Um, and they do really wonderful work leading music, leading dance. Um, last year, we did this on the ship, which was really wonderful. We actually had funding from the Mellon Foundation to provide transportation to everyone. Um, this year, um, since we can't, do that. Um, instead, what we're able to do is send packages to people who register for the program that will include music makers like maracas, some dance ribbons, and some other decorations to go along with the season. So we're really excited um, to be collaborating with Rhythm Break Cares again. And the music focuses on the years of intrepid service, so 1943 to 1974, a lot of variety there, as well as the places that intrepid traveled, which was all over the world. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, so this is just a reminder that we have our next program, Stories Within, the last one of the season. Um, that's for individuals and their care partners. Um, that's going to be next Thursday at 2 o'clock. Um, and you can just register by emailing access at intrepidmuseum.org. And our winter tea dances, the first one is December 9th. Um, and if you register by two weeks before the program, um, you're eligible to have a, a package shipped to you. Registration um, will be limited. Um, and I know it says registration open, but it's actually going to be going online, I think, tomorrow over the weekend. Um, so that'll be going live uh, very soon. So if you go to our website, intrepidmuseum.org slash education slash stories within, we'll put that in the chat. Um, you'll see that registration form up either tomorrow or over the weekend. Um, so you can sign up for that pro the first of those programs as well. Um, and on our next slide, I'll just note that our Stories Within programs, um, like Fun and Games, Airman Escapades, those are available if you'd like to book one of those for an organization um, or a group that serves individuals with dementia, we'd be happy to set something up. Um, but I'm happy to hand it over to Ipe, who'll talk about um, some of the offsite art series and how that looks now. Yes, thank you, Charlotte. And hello, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Um, so as Charlotte mentioned, I'm going to speak about our Stories Within programs that are specifically offered to organizations. So if you are a program manager or a program director interested in scheduling some virtual programs for the seniors um, who are participating in your programs, then these are those. And we have three different programs that we're offering. Um, these are all what we call our, our um, art making series. When we did them in person, we would do them between the months of September and April, and we would travel out um, to our partner sites and deliver these programs on location for their seniors. Um, we are right now doing all of those virtually. So we actually will ship materials to your site in advance. Um, 
so that seniors can have them um, and work with them. Or if people are in their homes individually, then um, we can just sort of skip that step and deliver the program directly. But so the three programs that we offer, one of them is the power of music. Um, we are looking at how sailors use music to bond and to spend their time on the ship. Um, participants are listening to music from all of the eras that Intrepid served in, additionally working with oral histories of former crew members, um, discussing uh, memories of leisure and recreation activities, and the program concludes in the participants creating their own mixed media work. Um, so that is our Power of Music series, which really deals with musical selections um, from throughout the 40s all the way up through 74, as Charlotte mentioned. We also have our Intrepid service in the 40s, which is really gearing specifically on the 40s, looking at photographs that highlight Intrepid's role in World War II taken aboard the ship listening to some of the decades top tunes and when we're look, listening to music we also have lyric um, lyric slides that are up so that people can actually sing and participate along as the music is playing. Um, and then again, this particular workshop also concludes with a mixed media um, art making activity. And we have frames where participants are able to actually frame their work and sort of leave the program with a nice framed keepsake that reminds them of the, the, the activity. Um, and then we added on, this is our second year running these offsite art series. So we saw that some of our participants really love uh, the art making activities and some of them actually just really love listening to music, following along the lyrics and participating in the discussion with our educator. So we have an entirely discussion based program as well titled Life Aboard. Um, and that program is uh, really focusing and honing in on Intrepid's history of service and what was the experience of living aboard the ship, um, which is also known as the City of Sea. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So I just wanted to throw some images up. Um, these are some programs that were done at one of our partner sites this past winter. Um, so we can see in that first top image, our educator Elise is showing and discussing some of the photographs that were taken aboard the ship. In that middle image, she's showing one of the models of the Intrepid that we have. So in person, we would usually bring sort of different models um, and things along with us to sort of demonstrate um, and in lieu, obviously, we'll be showing photographs and we'll also be using video from our Google Arts and uh, Culture tour that we have that is taken aboard the Intrepid. So we really try to give as much experience of showing um, objects from our collection woven into these programs. And then on the bottom is one of the mixed media works that was made by one of our participants. And we can go to the next slide. That might be... Um, so we just have our contact information, should you be interested in getting in touch with us um, about any of the programs that we've discussed today. We have our website links, which we have in our chat, and we can go ahead and also type our email addresses in the chat as well. Um, so please, if you have any questions or if you're interested in scheduling programs, don't hesitate to reach out to either Charlotte or myself. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Samantha Schott. I am the manager of access programs at the Jewish Museum. Um, the Jewish Museum, if you have or have not been there, I see a few familiar names on this list, which is great. Um, we're a museum that's on the Upper East Side. We're on 92nd and 5th Avenue, so right across the street from Central Park. Um, and we're a museum that explores the intersection of art and Jewish culture um, throughout history. Our collection, which I'll talk about at the end of this, um, expands over 4,000 years of history. So we have everything from archeological objects to um, uh, very contemporary artwork to ritual objects, things that you might find in a home, um, all looking at for different people um, how they interact with Judaism. But of course our collection is accessible and open to people who are not Jewish as well. Um, 
if you have or have not been to the Jewish Museum on the right side of the slide, this is an image of the outside of the building. Um, it's actually a building from 1908 that was uh, used to be someone's home. It was called the, the home of the, of the Warburg family. Um, so it's a really wonderful intimate space when we're able to be there in person again. Um, I hope everyone can go and experience this really beautiful place that has so much history and, and uh, you know, background of being together as a family and then was given to the Jewish Museum in the 40s. Um, okay, you can go to the next slide. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about our JM Journeys program, um, which is our program for, for visitors with dementia and their care partners. Um, I'll just mention quickly at the beginning that I'm not going to go in depth to our, our partnerships or to the, the visits that we do um, the private visits that we do, JM Journeys is our program that's open to anyone who wants to join, but we have partnerships in all five boroughs of the city that we're doing right now. Um, and we are always open to groups contacting us and um, wanting to have a visit to the museum. Um, so, uh, but I'm gonna focus a little bit on our JM Journeys program. So this is, as you've heard from a few other, similar to a few other places, it's a monthly program. And we do two sessions each month. So we have a morning session that's specifically for participants with early stage dementia and their care partners if, care part if their uh, care partners choose to come. And we have an afternoon session that's open for all participants with memory loss. So early stage to later stage um, and their care partners as well. And I just wanna say at the start here that having care partners, aides, anyone um, who wants to join um, we really aim to create a space that is for um, individuals with dementia as well as their care partners. All, all voices who come to our program are, are really valued um, and we want to create a space that, you know, is about everyone who's there. Um, this is a, a, an image of one of our longtime GM Journeys participants. And just so you can start to see some of the diversity of what we have on view, um, he's gazing up at a wall of fabric samples that was a show focused on the work of uh, fashion designer Isaac Mizrahi. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So there's generally two parts to all of our programs. For the first half of the program, we spend some time exploring artwork through, from the museum. Um, generally, it's either focused on a temporary exhibition or on a theme that's chosen by our educator. Um, and we explore generally two, two to four artworks um, through discussion, but also wanting to keep our programs really multi-sensory, providing multiple ways for people to access a work of art. We might do sketching, we might um, bring in music, video, as, as a number of people have talked about. Um, we might bring in touch objects, things to smell, all that kind of stuff. We want to give everyone an access point to what we're doing. Um, so then after we look at, at, at some works of art, we follow it up by making our own art inspired by what we just explored in the galleries or in the virtual realm. Um, and we're always trying to change this up. We might do printmaking, we might do painting, we might do sculpture. Um, our educators have a lot of fun with introducing new things and making sure that um, people get to try out all different kinds of materials. Um, something that I just want to say is I think the really key point to our program is that whether we're in the galleries talking about work or we're making our own art, our main focus is just making sure that everyone's voices are heard and everyone's voices are valued, whether that is contributing something to the discussion, that is um, uh, you know, bringing an object to share with the group um, that is just in your presence in the program, um, or it's in sharing the art that you create. Um, everyone who comes to the program is, we're really aiming to make everyone feel valued and have them know that they're part of our community and, and what everyone comes in and contributes really matters. Um, okay, next slide. So like everyone else, we are now virtual. Um, I wanted to just highlight some of the, the little changes that we've made and, and the image that's on here is of one of our educate our wonderful educators, Holly Ecker, leading a program. Um, we'd all just done some sketching. And so everyone is holding up their sketches in the, in the Zoom screen so that we can all share with each other. Um, so again, these happen once a month. They're one hour programs. During these one hour programs, we spend about 40 minutes exploring art, 
and then 20 minutes making art and sharing out. That's a little flexible, but that's the general breakdown. Um, even though we can't be in person and we can't necessarily give you something to hold or uh, smell, we're, we still try to make these programs really multi-sensory. So playing music, playing videos, um, uh, we might ask you to bring your own sense from home and, or your own touch objects so that um, we can have all of those elements um, in there. And something that I just want to say that I've been really enjoying about our virtual programs is that the Jewish Museum has about 30,000 objects in our collection. Um, but, you know, if you come to the museum, you're only going to see about five or 600 of, on, of them on view at any given point. So being virtual, while I love seeing everyone in person, has given us a great opportunity to really dig into the things that have been in the archives for years that we wouldn't get to see otherwise. So um, I thought I'd just show you a few things in our collection, a few things that we've explored recently or that we might explore coming up in the future. So you can go to the next slide. So these are a number of different things that are in the museum's collection. Um, I wanted to give you guys a, a sense of, of the breadth of what you might see if you come to a Jewish museum program. So in the top right corner, there's a kind of very traditional pastel landscape um, created by a German artist. Right next to it at the top is one of my favorite um, Hanukkah lamps that are in our collection. It is um, eight iron chairs um, and each one would hold a candle. Um, I think the ninth one in the set was was lost, if I remember correctly. Um, on the bottom left, there is a sculpture by contemporary artist Deb Cass, which is called Oi Yo. And it's a pretty big sculpture. It stands about five feet high and uh, has big blocky yellow letters Oi, which you can walk around and, and see it from multiple angles. Um, I also want to highlight our photography collection, which we've been having a lot of fun exploring online. Um, we actually have a photography exhibition that's going to be opening in the spring called Modern Look uh, Photography in the American Magazine. So about the relationship between Jewish photographers and, and fashion magazines, um, really focusing on the 1950s and 60s and the kind of avant-garde art that developed between these two institutions of the time. Um, I think I'm just going to pause there. Um, I really enjoyed the chance to get to come speak with everyone and um, hear about what's happening at other institutions as well. So I'll put my contact information as well as our website where you can see the specific dates of our programs in the chat. And if you have any questions or you're curious about the Jewish Museum or, or anything else, you can um, just reach out to me there. So thank you all. And there's one more slide, but you can just skip it. Thanks, Samantha. Um, I'm going to jump in once again and encourage our caregivers and, and people who are participating in this uh, event to uh, put any questions or comments that you have in the chat. And we will um, be able to answer most or, or all of them during the Q&A uh, in the next section of the event. Um, so next we have the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Hi, everybody. Um, so my name is Shannon Daniels, and I uh, work as a program associate at the Met Museum. Um, and so I just will talk a little bit about our programs for people with dementia and their caregivers at the Met. Um, so do you mind going to the next slide? experiences with art um, to improve the quality of life for people with dementia and their caregivers um, and provide opportunities for cognitive, physical, and social stimulation, which is all the more important now that um, we're in, you know, we're doing everything virtually. Um, and we also want to uh, give caregivers sort of a respite um, and try to alleviate some isolation and stress by fostering communication um, and comfort. And really a big goal is making a, a community of dyads, of people with dementia and their care partners, um, and to encourage conversations with each other. Um, do you mind going to the next slide? So what we offer for people with dementia and their care partners um, right now 
are um, two different scheduled programs. And one is Metascapes, which we had been doing prior to the pandemic too. Um, and so Metascapes and the Met Memory Cafe are both virtual now. And Metascapes is a sort of interactive guided tour, um, usually of a special exhibition or a gallery in the museum. Um, and so uh, participants will look at four to six works of art um, together through guided looking um, led by the educators. Um, and then they'll do an activity afterward that can include some art making, it may include poetry, um, and it may include some stretching or some movement. And we just started our Met Memory Cafe uh, during uh, virtually, so in April. And this is a really sort of casual space for um, dyads to come and you know brew a cup of tea or coffee um, and sort of share uh, their thoughts about a couple works of art and about their lives together. So we've asked participants to come to bring um, an object in their home that um, has a story behind it or to bring um, different sort of sensory things in their home, um, like different textures in their home to make art with it or um, tea from their home to smell it. And we really tried to make things as multi-sensory as possible, um, given that everything is all virtual too. Um, and so we also do partnerships with um, different organizations that serve seniors throughout um, the New York City metropolitan area, including assisted living facilities, senior centers, um, and nursing homes. Um, and we offer tours, art making, and offsite programs by request um, as well. We have a support group that has been going on um, weekly, uh, virtually as well, um, for people who have been recently diagnosed with dementia or Alzheimer's and want to share that experience with other people who are also, um, who also have that diagnosis. And I do want to give a shout out to um, our sort of collaborator organization, Arts and Minds, that does a lot of these kinds of programs um, in museums around the city um, in a multilingual way. And so in English and in Spanish. Um, and right now we are developing some online and on-site resources for um, dyads who want to go on self-guided tours of the museum um, on their own and just uh, might want something that is a bit more structured or uh, guided in a way uh, for looking at the many, many pieces of art at the Met. Um, could you go to the next slide? So I just wanna show you some photos of what our programs look like. Um, and so this is from uh, the Met Memory Cafe on April 15th and the theme was collecting stories. A lot of the Met Memory Cafes will have um, uh, themes that sort of incorporate uh, different aspects of the collection really across the different galleries. And so it could be collecting stories. We've had one on music where participants shared um, some of their favorite songs and we got to listen to some of it um, at, at, at that workshop um, or food or storytelling. And so we'll show high resolution photos of the works of art that we've chosen um, and just lead participants um, in guided looking so that together we can sort of make meaning out of the art that we're looking at. Could you go to the next slide? And so afterward, um, we'll usually uh, sort of use the art as a jumping off point for looking at um, sort of at, for doing activities that um, sort of get people moving um, or get people talking about their lives um, and get people to sort of engage um, and make the connection with the art. And so this is an example of one of our educators, um, again, Holly Eckert. Gail, what, who, heavy winds and rain? Yeah, one of our educators who um, asked participants to sort of gather accessories um, throughout their homes and wear all of those accessories and talked about um, the head coverings and the costumes in uh, the painting, The Fortune Teller. Um, and so it was just a sort of fun way to like move around, gather things throughout the home um, and then sort of make art inspired by it. 
And we've done other activities as well. Um, for instance, poetry activities where we'll send um, refrigerator magnet style um, tiles of words uh, to participants that they can print out and cut up at home or write out and then cut up at home um, so that they can move them around and form uh, sentences or form lines of poetry. Um, and so our programs and our activities, we um, try our best to make them as uh, open to all levels of dementia as possible. Um, and so that's anyone from someone who's just received a diagnosis to um, people who may not be verbal. Um, and we really do want there to be a way for everybody to participate. And could you move to the next slide? So um, if you have any questions about these programs um, or you have a group or know a person that you might want to uh, sign up for one of these programs or you have some kind of interest in a by request tour, please do feel free to email us at access at netmuseum.org or call us at 212-650-2010. I'll put this information in the chat as well. Um, and the museum is also open now. Um, they're closed on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, um, but both locations, the Fifth Avenue location and at the Cloisters are open um, with some limited capacity um, and recommending required, uh, sorry, recommending advanced registration, but I really encourage you to go if you're able to. Um, if there's any questions you have, I'm going to stay back a little bit uh, in the time in between uh, this first hour and the next hour of presentation. So you can also feel free to ask me then. Um, and that's pretty much it for me, unless anyone has any questions. Thank you, Shannon. That was so exciting. I wish that we had thought of doing um, an, a, a workshop with the head coverings. I am really inspired with that. Thanks. Uh, I, so my name is Michelle Arnault. I'm the Senior Director of External Relations for PSS Circle of Care. I wanna thank everybody for being here today. I especially wanna thank Melissa Sheehan and Meredith Wong, my collaborators and partners who put this amazing program together. I am so, uh, moved by all this and just sitting by myself is not the same Melissa as being at 305 with all the noise and the uh, hugs and handshakes and I especially miss having that wonderful um, apple cider so I'm drinking some tea in honor <laughs> of you Melissa and 305. I also want to shout out to my wonderful outreach team, Shaina Jacques and Gavin Castor. Gavin, thank you for Hi. putting together this PowerPoint, which is um, really amazing and especially uh, awesome that you were able to put it together so quickly. So thanks, Gavin, for that. Um, I guess I should also thank our presenters so far, Concerts in Motion, Elizabeth from the Folk Art Museum, that amazing um, performance from Orpheus, the Intrepid, the Jewish Museum, and the Metropolitan Museum. So now I'm just going to say a few words about PSS. I'm sure most of you already know about us. We are PSS Circle of Care. Uh, we're now a multi-service agency who works to, well, we have 10 senior centers throughout the city. And we have a program called Circle of Care, which is specifically funded to help families and friends looking after older adults who have some sort of memory loss. Um, we're completely free because we're grant funded. And uh, we have social workers in every borough who are available to work with families and friends to make a plan for next steps to help you to connect to all these wonderful resources that we have. And to, um, we even provide respite. So we have lots to offer you. You can contact us through 
our website and also uh, to address these slides as they're going through. We have a wonderful and very robust program called PSS Life University, which uh, provides free webinars every day, such as this one, on every topic of interest to older adults in New York City. And we've had some fabulous presenters such as Melissa Sheehan, and I'm sure Meredith, you're going to be on our roster soon. Um, so I encourage you to look at our website and sign up for our programs, PSS Life University. It's very easy to find us. And I also would like to ask you if you have any questions, this is the opportunity, although it's also an opportunity to get up and stretch, which is something that probably many of you would like to do now. Um, if there are any questions, we're here to answer them. If you'd like to speak to any of the presenters, find out more about um, the art programs, the workshops, the amazing musicians who we've been featuring and will be featuring. As Meredith said, our, our last performance will be from Sing for Your Seniors with Jackie Vanderbeck. And um, that's going to be a wonderful way to end the program. So would now I will pass the baton to uh, Meredith. Would you like to say something about Caring Kind? I would love to. Uh, again, I really appreciate everyone for attending this virtual event. Um, and I want to send out a big thank you to the co-hosts, uh, Michelle Arnault and Melissa Sheehan. Uh, we've been talking about this for probably since the last Artful Aging. I think um, both of you approached me and said, can we put this together? Uh, together? So we did. And um, little did we know that this would uh, be the format we'd be in, but I think we uh, we work together well, um, and Caring Kind is really grateful to be part of this. Um, we are an organization that is New York City based. Um, we have, in addition to the Connect to Culture program, which is the program um, uh, that is part of this event, um, we do have other programs and services, uh, all of which are free of charge, uh, because as as with PSS, we are 98.9% uh, uh, grant funded. Um, so we do count on our the families who come to us and to our very generous donors uh, for that. Um, so with Connect to Culture, if um, some of the people in the room don't know, is a program that connects families impacted by dementia uh, with the cultural organizations in New York City. Um, that's how it started. Um, now, since we're virtual, it may be expanded beyond New York City's uh, walls. Um, but for the moment, it's really to, um, to support the, the uh, organizations, the cultural organizations that already have these programs uh, through training and through education, and also to bring on more, to grow that list of organizations um, to kind of get on board. Um, and it can be anything from a community garden to a place like the Met. So um, it runs the gamut. Um, and the idea is to bring these programs into every borough of New York City. We have a couple of boroughs who are kind of on the cusp of, um, of developing some programs uh, that, that we've been involved in. Um, I also kind of come at it from the, the social service angle, the, from the residences and the senior living uh, facilities um, to let them know, you know, places like 305, who has been so supportive of these programs. Um, it's been wonderful. And Michelle at PSS has helped us get the word out and really, um, trying to, to develop this relationship so that we can let families know across the five boroughs about these programs. Um, other programs that we offer are um, things like social work services. Uh, we have dementia care specialists who uh, man the helpline who are on staff, um, who can talk you through a, a, a given a circumstance or refer you to adult day programs or other resources that are New York City based. Um, or we can 
just be on the phone with you. Um, people who are at the very beginning of this journey um, to people who are, who are more progressed and have been doing this caregiving, uh, being caregivers for um, many, many years. So we're, we're with you throughout that journey and that's the idea. Um, our support services are things like um, the Wander Safety Program, the Medical Wander Safety Program that helps to, um, to locate um, wanderers um, and bring them home safely. We have a, I think we have a very high success rate with that. I think something like 98, 99% success rate. Um, if you're interested in hearing about these and other of our programs and services, um, you're welcome to, to contact us through our helpline. That's really your first entree into all of this information. And that helpline, uh, which I'll the helpline number, which I'll put in the chat, is 646-744-2900. So you can reach any and all of us uh, on staff, um, all of whom are working from home at the moment, um, to, to see where you can begin. If you need to have that first conversation about what do I do as a caregiver, we can help you kind of start that journey. Um, so I also wanted to, to, to make a shout out to all of our presenters, uh, most of them in, the, in this current session and the session we just concluded are Connect to Cultural Partners. Um, most of the, the organizations in um, the next session are also um, Connect to Culture Partners. And I'm so grateful that, that they've all joined us um, to tell you about their wonderful programs. It's been a real um, advantage to work with these organizations. They're, they're very um, dedicated to creating these resources for um, caregivers like you. Um, so that's really as much as I can say at the moment. If, again, if you have any questions, I, I encourage everyone to either unmute yourself or put your questions or comments in the chat and um, we're happy to uh, help you answer them. Thanks very much. And Melissa, it's your turn if you'd like to say something about your organization. Melissa, you're muted. It's kind of hard to hear me that way, isn't it? Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, Michelle. And thank you, Meredith, uh, for being such wonderful partners to PSS and, and Caring Kind and, and for all of your wonderful support and putting this together and for your support every day with everything that we do here at 305 and in for, for joining us in caring for the older adults in the community that we all serve. Um, you're just invaluable um, in, in doing everything that you do and for especially uh, this year and in our unprecedented times in pivoting and supporting uh, as we've tried to keep our community not only engaged and empowered but safe um, as, as, as we've moved through, uh, through the, the new things that we do. And for all of our the partners who have been here today with everything that you've done um, to help us as we've got moved from having folks here to in, in person, in our community, in the rooms, to bringing so kindly and so generously as partners virtually to bringing New York City and all of the things that all of our residents have loved for all of their lifetimes bringing the city into them, it has just been invaluable in keeping our residents' spirits and lives, uh, continuing and keeping them uh, engaged and, and happy and keeping the, just keeping them together. It's just priceless. So we really appreciate it. Um, as most of you know, or as many of you probably know, 305 West End Assisted Living is a community that provides uh, luxury, independent assisted living, and memory care for older adults here on the Upper West Side at 74th Street and West End, uh, steps away from Lincoln Center. And uh, we've been here for about the past three years. We're part of a community uh, that uh, has been providing solutions, residential solutions for older adults for over 20 years. And in the past uh, year, we have uh, pivoted, as many of us have, and turned a lot of our safe focus into providing really safe solutions, residential solutions 
for those older adults and making great homes where they can stay engaged and safe and continue to live uh, wonderful and terrific lives. Um, Gavin, if you'd be so kind um, and thank you so much for doing everything you're doing here on the back end to make everything run so seamlessly. Um, I'd love to just show a little bit of a video of what we have uh, going on here in the community. Um, if I can get this to run, technology is not always my friend, but I think I can. And I'll take you for a little bit of a tour inside our community here. This is 305 West End. Is everyone seeing it? This is as you enter our community for living room. Melissa, it's Meredith. Um, see it. Do you want to put on your share screen? I thought I did, sorry, just a second. Oops, because you're not seeing it, obviously. It happens when you try and do this without. Uh... Is it, you seeing it now? No, right? Yep, we got it. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Second, let me go back to the beginning just a second. This is our community. 305 West End Assisted Living, which is where we were last year and hopefully we'll be back again soon. We we're all, well, we we're all here now, but we were here last year joining for, for Artful Aging. And our garden room where residents enjoy on the second floor. This is where we held Artful Aging last year. For those of you who were with us last year, we joined our cinema where residents can enjoy some films private dining, where we set up Artful Aging last year. Bistro Grill, which is our casual dining option. Our Bistro Performing Arts Center, where we enjoy our Orpheus in other times and other performances. Fitness Center, Occupational Therapy, our salon, we're able to have that. Our reflections memory care. We have two floors that are dedicated to our residents who have Alzheimer's and other related dementias and need additional support. That's a studio apartment. and our lobby. So again, we'd love to have you ask any questions. Please put your questions in the chat or just unmute. Um, we're so grateful to you and all of our partners for joining us here today. We really, really appreciate it. Thanks so much. And thank you so much to Michelle and to Meredith for your wonderful partnership and for being here today. To PSS and Caring Kind, and to all the organizations who've joined us. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you. Um, okay, I, we're a little ahead of schedule. It's now 2.30. Um, I'm able to stay online until our next session. And if Michelle and, and or Melissa uh, can, we will stay online. If you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask or put it in the chat. Um, our next session will start about 2.55 or so. Um, we have a great roster coming up uh, in the ne next section uh, of music and um, actually lots of music and um, some of our museums. So please uh, join us at around five to three. Thanks, so it's everyone. good. It's good seeing everyone. How is everyone doing with uh, with resources? Has everyone been anyone been going to these programs, or have we? How have we been doing with stuff? Marilyn, good to see you. 
Hyacinth, Chandra. Feel free to unmute and join us if you'd like, or if you're getting a drink, we'd love to hear from you. Melissa, do you want to, are you sharing your screen? Am I sharing my screen? Stop, it's, stop yeah. share. Yeah, we're, there, there we go. go. There we go. <laughs> there you go. I was enjoying that Wissiaka um, presentation. <laughs> there you go. There we go. So yes, please, please um, feel free to uh, enable your video so we can see your faces uh, and unmute yourself so we can yep. say hello. Hello, Leonie. How are you? We're so happy Hi, you're here today. Jackie, good to see you. Well, I would like to say that uh, for PSS, we closed our doors uh, of Circle of Care on March uh, 13th, and we've been working remotely ever since. And surprisingly or um, amazingly, we pivoted to this format overnight, and uh, we were doing webinars prior, but now, of course, it's an everyday event. And... Um, our support groups have all gone virtual as well. And I'm sure everyone can relate to that. And maybe attendance is up as a result too, because now people don't have to travel as far. So if you'd like, I'd like to compare notes with people. Do you find that uh, you have better attendance because people can just dial in or, or did people really want to travel on the subway? <laughs> mm, no. What, what are other people finding? I think Caring Kind is doing well uh, as well, right, Meredith? Well, yeah, I mean, as with everyone else, we've um, we pivoted very quickly mid-March and most of us, well, all of us um, have been working with, from home since. Some of our staff has been kind of rotating into the offices slowly, um, but we have some of our trainings uh, some have been pre-recorded, some have been uh, live streamed. Um, we're, we're trying to find our feet. So I think we're, we're doing that. Our gala was just a couple of nights ago. And if ever, anyone uh, missed it, it was a wonderful event. It was fabulous. Mm -hmm. uh, it was recorded. So it actually lives on our website and I can put that website link oh, in the chat. Um, that would be great, Meredith. Yeah, it was, it was really wonderful. And it did... Um, Caring Kind decided to recognize Connect to Culture, which was wonderful. Um, oh, it was part of a, a really interesting panel discussion. Um, yes. So you're able to oh. listen to that. So Meredith yeah, was, was on the panel and Jed, it was fabulous. So. Yes. Oh yes, and we honor Jed uh, for his yes. lifetime, lifetime work and experience uh, and skill in this field. Um, he's been a wonderful, he's really actually been a mentor to me um, coming on um, as kind of, kind of a newbie to this world, um, to the uh, dementia care world. So I really, um, he's an invaluable resource. How about you, Melissa? So it was great. We've had terrific, um, terrific attendance on our virtual programs and it's been really great to reach folks who are in the city and who are not in the city and just to be able to expand our programming um, and offer the kinds of cultural resources that have only been able to really, that have had that, just that Manhattan footprint to folks who have been outside of the city and to watch, uh, to have, it, to, it, to offer those kinds of resources to so much, so many more people. It's really been terrific and it's been really a gift. Um, you know, it's, they say that every cloud has a silver lining and that's really been the pandemic silver lining we've found. So. It's been neat. And some people who have maybe been too frail otherwise or mm -hmm. had uh, other underlying health concerns who maybe haven't been able to join for other reasons have been able to participate in other, in other ways. And it's really been a neat thing. And we've been very pleased by that, so. Yeah, I've actually heard from a lot of our cultural partners um, who said, you know, in the past, of course, they, um, they love having people from the, from the immediate community uh, where they are and, and some have traveled from other boroughs. But now that we're virtual, the, the, um, the context of this program is global. 
I mean, it, we went oh. from very, very local to very, very global in a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. um, and so we hope that more and more people learn about these programs around the world. Um, and this is not just happening in the United States, it's happening internationally too. Mm -hmm. There are programs uh, popping up. Um, I think some in China, some in the Netherlands, you know, Europe is kind of yeah. um, really taking the baton and run with it. So we're really happy to see that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I wish we could hear ja from Jackie because uh, from AFA because I know they're the programming, um, some of the programming that they're doing as well has been really terrific. Also, um, in terms of having that uh, national footprint, it's been really terrific and global footprint. Yeah, yeah, the AFA has um, been wonderful and certainly as well. PSS has a wide a wide footprint with their PSS University. Also, the programs reach um, have an amazing uh, breadth of. Uh, of uh, attendees as we well. did it, it did explode um with the <laughs> virtual platform it was <laughs> shocking yeah so um we do have uh in november we're going to have a series with difta of chat with the expert so uh every day there's a different expert uh with sponsorship of DIFTA. so that's something that uh all yes. are yeah. And also uh, next week, we have a couple of exciting events that I might as well announce. One of them, which Gavin set up is with a woman, uh, Dr. Hummel, who's in early stage dementia herself. And she's going to um, speak about her experience as um, well as a pastor and as somebody with this diagnosis. So that's exactly a week from today. Wow. So yeah. Um, we're also at PSS very involved in dementia friendly communities. So we have set up um, in every borough a different dementia friendly community in order to raise people's consciousness and destigmatize the, um, the illness. Uh, so we have ambassadors throughout the city who uh -huh. are working to, uh, to speak to businesses and to address uh, this issue, which which everybody on this call is aware of. Uh -huh. So we can tell you more about that too. Probably not today, but um, feel free to get in touch with me if, and I'll be happy to connect you with our DFC people. Um, there Actually, there are two comments that I wanted to highlight in the chat. One was from uh, Dana. She's asking, she um, wasn't able to watch the, the first session. Um, but notice that we were recording this. So, Michelle, do you know if this will be posted on your website? It, it or is there a way to access them? Yes, it will be. And um, maybe not next week, though, but uh, next week is a big week in our country. But <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe, maybe, um, maybe in two weeks, we'll, I don't want to promise anything, but let's say a week from Monday, it should be on the website, yes. Okay, so very soon. Uh, the other was from Jackie at AFA, Jackie Gatto, G-A-T-T-O. She says, feel free to email her at J-G-A-T-T-O at ALZFDN.org for more information about AFA's virtual community class programming. Um, so she's the, the Alzheimer's Foundation is really a, a wonderful resource, and they've been a um, they've been a partner of ours as well. So I do encourage everyone to to contact Jackie about their resources. Right. Would well, any of our caregivers like to like to share their experiences with online programming? The good, the bad, and the ugly. Anything I can help you with? Well, while we're waiting for a caregiver to uh, to step forward, uh, I was going to ask Shannon about the museum opening. So do you have any on-site events? Is Shannon still here? Yeah, um, I'm still here. Yeah. Um, yeah, we don't have any on-site events um, just because we want to you know, uh, prevent the spread. But um, it is open if you want to go just sort of on your own or with a family member or a friend. Um, and they're putting a lot of social distancing measures in to make it safe. Of course. So your so the uh, your program will remain virtual for the moment. Okay. Yeah, our program is going to be virtual for the foreseeable future. Got it. And have a lot of people been returning to the museum? How is it? How is the 
the museum been oh, what's been going on at the museum? Yeah, um, I think especially when it first reopened, there were like lines outside, socially distanced <laughs> lines outside because people were so excited to finally be back. And there's a great picture on the Instagram of someone who's like just walked into the museum and is just like got his hands up in the air, <laughs> like really happy that he can be back. I can imagine, um, right? Yeah, it's complicated for a really big place like the Met. They have um, like special like socially distanced lines for like special exhibitions because they know that those get so crowded um, and they you have to make an advanced registration so they can just limit the number of people in the building at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also am like kind of interestingly, um, one of the, the contemporary Chinese artists um, that I know through other channels um, did an inst a dance installation, kind of a movement installation um, together with a visual installation in the Great Hall, in the basically the lobby of the Met when it was closed. And it was mm -hmm. a very meditative experience. It was wonderful. Mm -hmm. So there, there are, um, you know, when do you ever get to see the Metropolitan without anyone in it, except mm. for these dancers? It was just, it was a wonderful experience. Wow. Yeah, I mean, the, the kind of, you were, you mentioned, I think Michelle, the silver lining is that these are spaces that are meant to be populated. They're meant to, mm -hmm. they're meant to be for the masses, so to speak. Um, so now, uh, well, we have spaces that are reopening. And even at that point, I think Shannon is at like 25% capacity. I think that's the cap. Um, and for somewhere like the Metropolitan or, or any of the, the more established museums and even really for the smaller ones, um, it's been um, a struggle, but it's also been a chance for museum professionals to reconsider their spaces and how they might use them um, in this particular context. And it's, it's wonderful to hear how people are rethinking their collections and their spaces and their resources. Um, so it's, it's kind of putting a pause on the, the hubbub and the activity. We just, you know, take a breath and um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's actually been very, um, it's stimulated a lot of really interesting conversations. Mm -hmm. I'd also like to ask if Dana is available if you could tell us something about your um, your instrument. Are you there, Dana? I see you're online. Oh, or Angela. Angela? Yeah, unfortunately. Um, oh, she left, okay. Yeah, she had to go teach a lesson. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. Well, that was an amazing performance. I thought, um, thank you so much. And, and what do you play, Angela, if you'd like to share? Um, I actually play the flute, <laughs> so very different instrument. Okay. Um, uh, I don't know if you have your flute handy or if you'd like to tell us something <laughs> about um, playing the flute. What is the experience when you play the flute uh, for this particular audience? Well, I actually, so um, I'm actually not a uh, one of the musicians, uh, the yeah, I just work in administration, but my background is I did go to school for music performance. Um, I play the flute and I actually, in college, I did do some programs that were very similar to this. Um, and it, it's always really lovely, like Dana mentioned, uh, you know, when you're doing a performance on the stage, there's always this barrier in between you and your audience and doing programs like our Orpheus Reflections program really kind of removes that. And it, it's not only like intimate, you know, for the audience members, but also for performers, um, and, you know, and sharing your music. But uh, uh, clearly it's so different because you don't get the uh, response, you know, that you typically get when you're in the room with people. I guess uh, that's, oops. I see, does everybody see a, a change? Yeah, that's Leon, Leonie's is, is sharing her Oh, screen. I'm sorry, something came up. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Well, congratulations. It's a beautiful <laughs> picture. Uh, there must have been a wedding. I wasn't able to go. What can I tell you? I wasn't able to go. It's my best friend's daughter. So. Uh, beautiful. <laughs> it's a beautiful photo. Congrats. Yeah. 
They, I'm sorry, it just showed up. <laughs> it's okay. Well, thank you. For thank you for sharing. So oh, I'm so glad. <laughs> <laughs> She just said them recently, so it came out. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other um, people from our um, cultural presenters still online, still with us? Let's see. Um, can, can I just ask if the PSS Circle of Care where is it actually located? Because I never have known that. We're throughout the city. So we're uh, in Jackie is here. Jackie Vanderbeck. Sorry. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. So, so there are several sites throughout the city? Uh, we are not actually in a site. You would have to call our number and then we would um, uh, connect you to a support group or to a care consultant. Um, if you're interested, I can send you um, our contact details. Yeah, that would be good. But I, I guess mostly you don't mind not sharing. I mean, uh, I think we're going to have to not share your screen after a while. But oh. it's okay right now. I, I see that one of our presenters, Jackie Vanderbeck, is um, yeah. available. Would okay. you like, Jackie, are you here? Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi. So Jackie is um, the founder of Sing for Your Seniors, and she will be performing um, later. If you'd like to say something about your organization, uh, please go ahead. Oh, sure. Can you all see me? I'm not sure. I'm seeing. I'm not. Just, we see you. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I'm Jackie. I'm the founder of Sing for Your Seniors, and I'm just. This morning has just been so inspiring. I just wanted to say how incredible it is to be listening to people's music and listening to yeah. um, the museums share um, the incredible work that they're doing. I'm just so proud to be to be here. So thank you for inviting us. Um, we, we, of course, miss being in person, obviously, at, at, at 305, one of our community partners. Um, but, um, but I agree, and um, we've definitely had some silver lining with this format. Um, Sing for Your Seniors now, you know, can do sessions um, on the East Coast in the morning and on the West Coast in the afternoon. And, and um, so it's kind of amazing that way. And we've also been able to integrate, and we'll talk a bit about this later, but um, family members who've been disconnected mm. from um, from their family members who are living in assisted living places that are on a strict lockdown can actually join on our on our sessions and so they can watch their family members um, interact with the music oh, and great. have something to later talk to them on, on the phone about and so it's really <laughs> yeah. been neat to kind of build a bridge in that way um, for yeah. some of our community partners that's great yeah yeah but Could we're you put excited to sing for you guys a little later. We'll close out close out this amazing um, Artful Aging Fair with with some with some songs. Jackie, could you write that uh, in the in the care program? Could you write down your contact uh, information? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. And you'll see me pop off here in a minute because Maggie and I are going to do our sound check and then I'll pop right back on. <laughs> so it's a good time to ask you. <laughs> and Jackie, you started this um, organization. Wow. Based, could you tell us more about how you did that? Sure, yeah. Um, well, uh, we actually celebrated our 15th year in August. Um, but wow. I, um, I'm a musical theater performer. Um, I went to school for musical theater and upon graduating, when I moved to New York, you know, I grew up very close with my grandparents. Um, they lived next door to me and I had a very close relationship with my great grandmother and uh, music was always a part of our household. And, and I think when I moved wow. to the city as a young adult, I was very, um, I, I felt disconnected from elders in my life. And so I was yeah. really seeking 
to connect with um, the elders in my new my new home of New York City. Um, and also, um, as a performing artist, um, you audition a lot. You audition, you know, you sing short snippets of songs for producers and, and you do that, you know, pretty regularly. And after a while, it, it's, um, it becomes, you feel a little disconnected from the work because the only time you're ever sharing that work is um, to try to get a job. And so I was really looking for an opportunity to reconnect with my passion and my love for the art form of musical storytelling and uh -huh. kind of marry that with my desire to connect with elders in my community, but kind of struggling to, to find where to do that. So I reached out to a senior center in the West Village. Um, they were the adult day senior center, um, health center. And um, I started going down there uh, and singing for them every week. And I kind of started running out of songs. And so I invite my friends to come with me. And then at the time, my roommate was a pianist. And so I kind of say Sing for Your Seniors built itself. It's artists from the Broadway community that are wanting to connect um, with their elders using a musical storytelling. And so um, every, you know, we've grown a lot. Every community that we visit is different. We, you know, as you all know, living in New York, all the different right. neighborhoods, um, so many diverse cultures that we're able to pull from um, the Broadway repertoire, repertoire, the Great American Songbook, and even some pop material, whatever um, resonates the most with the communities that we serve. We're really looking to find out what that is and really, you know, cultivate that experience special for them. And so, um, yeah, so the Broadway community has been um, just so impassioned by this work. And we're so lucky that, you know, everybody um, is just raised their hand and wants to be involved. And so it's really, as I mentioned before, sort of that bridge between um, the Broadway world and, um, and our elders. Right. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing. Sure, sure. And for joining us from the West Coast. Send us some sunshine. We're oh, in no. oh, I will. <laughs> I will. <laughs> so we're almost ready for our second half. Last uh, call for any remarks or any um, questions. We have a few minutes. I'm thinking back to last year, Melissa, it was such a hubbub and it, the weather was so beautiful. And now we're all on the screen. This is, our, this, is our, this is our virtual year and next year will be our breakout year, right? Okay. <laughs> Let's... Pandemics end, ladies and gentlemen, pandemics end. That's right. So I'm looking forward to that end. I do, but I think for, for the, the cultural partners that I work with, many of them have really recognized the value of having online programs oh, yes. Uh, yes. for people yeah. who, are, no, no, no. who are not able to come, you know, go out. Um, it's been a real lifesaver to a lot of caregivers and a yes. lot of people they care for. So, and a lot of isolated people, like like we've both said, mm -hmm. and, a, and a lot of isolated people, and a lot of people who are truly homebound to have that ability to join when you can't otherwise join, and for us too, people who really haven't been able to go out to to be able to bring the city into our residence has really been a boon to us as well. So. It's true. We're very lucky that we have this opportunity and we're not truly isolated. So mm -hmm. again, true. a big thanks to everybody for making the time today to join, mm -hmm. every, join us all. We would, be, we would be really, truly isolated without Jackie and without Orpheus and without, I, I mean, I'm, I know I'm forgetting other people, you know, and, and I'm grateful to all of you, to all of the partners who are here today who have done so much to keep our residents so vital and vibrant and engaged and entertained and inspired. And I mean, oh, I can't just, I can't 
the gifts that they've given us uh, during this time is just, uh, mm -hmm. we can never repay what you've done for us. And we're just truly grateful for you, so. I would have to also say that um, what, what Samantha was saying uh, when she spoke about the JM Journeys program is that these programs are, are really for everyone in the room. Mm -hmm. um, a lot kind of when I first got started in access programs and programs for people with dis different disabilities, it was really kind of focused on the person with the, with the disability. Um, when I came to, to the realization that um, this particular population or these particular populations um, needed programs that stimulated, that connected, that supported um, through the arts and culture. It was really, um, it was an eye-opening moment to say, oh, well, caregivers are under an enormous amount of stress. And so the support that these programs give them, we hope mm -hmm. as cultural organizations, um, mm -hmm. we hope that it's as much uh, support and, and um, time of respite for them as well to connect with each other as well as the, the teaching mm -hmm. artists or the performers. Um, so we really hope that caregivers, um, those of you who are, who are a part of this event and maybe you have um, other people in your network and in your, in your circle, um, if they don't already know of, about these programs, please do let them know because we're, we're here mm -hmm. for you as much as uh, for the person with dementia. And I second that, Meredith. And I also would like to point out that at this point, everyone is a caregiver. We're yes. all locked in with somebody and we all could use um, some support. So don't forget that we all exist and there are resources and you're not alone. Yep. So Meredith, if, if you'd like to um, introduce the second uh, group, I think I we're ready to move along. Terrific. Um, so if you've been with us uh, through the first session, thank you for sticking with us. Um, we do enjoy having you as part of this event. If you're just coming on to our um, Artful Aging event, welcome. Um, we've had a wonderful first session, but we have um, an equally wonderful second session. Um, I also want to remind you, if you're planning to stay on for the Rubin Museum, please uh, make sure that you have a square of paper uh, for a folding activity later on. Uh, but before we get to that, I want to introduce Laura Sloan from Lincoln Center, who will kick off our um, session two. Hi, Laura. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Meredith. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. And I'll just give it a second. Oh, there we go. Thank you so much. I have some slides. I'm wow. definitely a visual person. So, um, and I wanted to give us some views of outdoor spaces and um, places that we wish we could be in person right now. But I did want to yeah. say thank you for being here virtually with us too. Uh, welcoming you into this space. Um, and hopefully we can gather again in person soon. I wanted to share this image. I, I love this image personally, but also I think it's a nice, um, just a, a reminder that we're still here for you, right? So Lincoln Center um, is still available for you to walk around on campus. Um, you can walk through any of the outdoor spaces on campus and spend time near the fountain or in the grove. So we're still here. Uh, I'll briefly introduce myself. I am Laura Sloan. I'm the Accessibility Manager at Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts. Uh, part of my role is working with a lot of different types of accessibility programs, uh, working with people with disabilities, but in general, just making sure that Lincoln Center is a welcoming space for all people. So I really like how Meredith was saying that uh, these are experiences for all people. And that's really the goal is to uh, make the performing arts accessible for everyone. So today I'm gonna to focus really on uh, our moments program. Uh, and then I'm gonna tell you about the program goals and structure pre-COVID. Uh, tell you a little bit about what it's like to be with this program in person. And then I'm gonna tell you how we adapted to the virtual space and how we pivoted to virtual programming. Um, and I'll end with a teaser about our upcoming fall season. All right, next slide, please. Great, thank you. So yes, um, Lincoln Center Moments uh, is part of the accessibility programming at Lincoln Center. It is a performance 
based program for individuals with dementia and their caregivers and families. So it's really meant to function as a community building type program um, and offering this high level of performance and programming that Lincoln Center has uh, specifically for these audiences. A lot of times programming is structured around uh, evening performances or very strict uh, structured performances. Uh, we, our goal is to bring that level of artistry to a more relaxed environment, to a very understanding environment and, uh, and a, a welcoming space. Um, so we are really lucky at Lincoln Center to be working with a, uh, there are 11 resident organizations combining to make up Lincoln Center. So we have like top artistry from New York Philharmonic, uh, the Metropolitan Opera, New York City Ballet, uh, Chamber Music Society. So we have such a, a variety of institutions to be working with and bringing on artistry and performers and programmers from all of these institutions. It's been a wonderful opportunity for us to bring this to our audiences. Uh, yeah, let's go to the next slide, please. Hmm. Okay, so on campus programming. And actually, I want to take a brief pause. Uh, I saw there was a question about outdoor stages. So yes, um, Lincoln Center is currently closed for any indoor performances, but the month of October, they had a series of uh, what we called new stages, this series of programming where it was programming outside so people can sit in the Grove and watch a performance. Um, and there was also the space on the lawn for people to watch performances. So that was a nice opportunity to gather uh, together again um, in-person outdoors. I don't, I, I'm actually not sure if they're going to be continuing that programming. It's pretty difficult into the winter to really have anything outdoors um, with the temperature mm. and all that. But uh, I will tell you about some of the cool programs we'll offer virtually. So uh, hopefully back together in person soon, but for now I'll tell you about the virtual stuff. Um, our on-campus programming, the a little bit of background about the way that Moments is structured uh, in person and on campus. So the we had a season in the fall and a season in the spring, and we had around eight programs a season, and we welcomed hundreds of people to these performances. And the programs were 90 minutes, and they were structured as the first half or the first portion of an hour being a performance in a hall, uh, and they would be top level artists um, from ranging from ballet to music, um, classical and contemporary and through to, um, we had contemporary dance and we even had um, as part of our campus, New York Public Library for the Performing Arts is a great resource. And we worked with them to host a movie night a uh, movie afternoon where um, we showed old movie clips from their archives. So it's a wide range of programming that we're offering and participants will come in and be welcome to the space. They will watch the performance for about an hour. Um, and that includes also some great uh, personal interactions with the artists. So we work with all of the artists to make sure they're welcoming to this group. Um, they have Q and A, they have interaction and engagement with the audience. So it's a really lively and uh, warm space. After the performance, um, the group is kind of uh, split up into smaller workshops. So individuals get this more intimate setting in a smaller space. So they'll leave the hall to be brought into a smaller workshop space. And uh, these workshops are led by our teaching artists and music therapists teamed up together. And each team will lead a group of around, there's usually no more than 25, 30 people in, in the space. So it does create this more um, intimate environment where you can really have conversations and talk about the performance. Um, you can deep dive on the themes of the performance so they can explore the content deeper. Um, and we always incorporate, uh, on, we try and hit on every level. Um, so we, we incorporate music and movement into these workshops. There's discussion uh, and there's art making and lots of interactive opportunities as part of these workshops. Um, we will get back to that one day when we're back in person, hopefully soon, hopefully by next year, but we want to make sure everybody is safe in the meantime. So um, 
I did include some images on here. I'll just describe these images briefly. At the top right, there is uh, an image from one of our workshops. And um, it is two lovely ladies uh, putting together a collage on a piece of paper. One of them is, mm -hmm. uh, is gluing down an image. So it, it's the art activities are also pretty diverse as well. And it's really meant to kind of engage people at all levels. So there's art making there. And then below that image on the bottom right, is a semicircle of chairs set up and people have their hands raised towards the ceiling um, yes. in this kind of warm-up stretching and movement activity. So lots of engagement there. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, great. So now we're just going to pivot and talk about what we've been doing lately. So uh, a little bit about post COVID and ways that we hope to continue to bring these virtual offerings, even after we can come back in person and just allowing people the opportunity to connect virtually if they continue to prefer doing that uh, or connecting in person if they want to come in in person for that. So immediately once COVID hit in, in late March, we immediately wanted to offer something to this audience. Uh, this audience uh, is, we work really closely with them. We hear from them regularly. We, we know that having a space and an opportunity to gather together to um, partake in the arts is super important. And especially after COVID, even more important, that need. So we wanted to give people something immediately. So we created a website uh, specifically dedicated to moments at home. So Lincoln Center Moments uh, became a virtual opportunity for people. And we started creating uh, materials and um, activities that people could do on their own at home and available anytime at home. So we were working with a lot of pre-recorded performances. Um, it was a way for us to immediately use content without having to take the time to record something or take the time to uh, plan ahead for these larger pro live programs. So we immediately were able to um, build lessons around that. We had our teaching artists and music therapists um, create videos to help people follow along at home uh, and, and just create a, also give a wide variety of content as well. So online, we have a variety of dance and music and theater. So it's, it's offering that online that people can do on their own time. Um, later into the season, we, when I think everybody started realizing that we, this COVID is not going to end anytime very soon. So um, once the in-person programs had to be postponed, uh, we, we realized that the importance for this community is that connection. So we wanted to shift that to the virtual space and have our live programs in the virtual space. So we planned several of these programs through the end of uh, the spring and into the summer. And we hosted them on Zoom. They were led by our teaching artists and music therapists. And in that same similar format, we're using pre-recorded materials so we can still give that high level concert experience that people can watch uh, and then building in engagement around those videos. Uh, still on Zoom, you're able to have that connection face to face, mm -hmm. whether you're not mm -hmm. physically face to face, you're in a space where you can still see people on the screen, and you can ask questions, you can have a uh, lively discussion, you can have activities, we were doing movement uh, activities at home through Zoom. So it was a great way to bring that similar structure to the program on Zoom. Mm -hmm. Um, next slide, please. Great. Okay. So I know I've been talking a while and we, we have a uh, limited time. So I wanted to give people the website for our moments at home. Um, and from there, you can sign up on the list. And I wanted to give a teaser about our fall season too. And actually, I'm realizing I can uh, put that into the chat as well. So I'm going to put a link to moments at home. I know you can't copy the link directly from the presentation. So I'm going to put okay. it here in the chat. Uh, 
that should be clickable. And you can check out our, we have a, a whole section on our fall season and also these lessons that we've created that are still evergreen that you can come back to and do at home or do with your family members and loved ones. Uh, so th those are available from this site too. And we have planned a full fall season. So we're still going to have uh, the eight programs that we typically do in person. They're all going to be virtual on Zoom and they're all going to be live programs still working with these artists from all of these different uh, parts of Lincoln Center. So New York Phil, we're working with jazz at Lincoln Center. We're working mm -hmm. with um, the ballet. Uh, we're working with the opera, the Met Opera. So we're still offering all of these wow. for the fall season and we hope you can sign up and register for that. Um, and I wanna thank everybody for their time. Yeah, attendance please. cap. I'm sorry, Meredith was asking if there's an attendance cap. So in person, we're limited by our hall space. Um, and that it, it usually ranges from about um, 150 to 200 people, depending on which space we've reserved in person. Um, but virtually, the the Zoom limit is our limit. So we could have up to 300 people. Um, and I, I did forget to mention that in that space, so there's 300 people in the space, but we do have small, we do Zoom breakout rooms. So you still get that small intimate environment in the virtual oh, space. Great. Thank you so much. Great. Wow. All right, should I just go on ahead? Um, I guess so. Um, I'm Lauren from Museum of Chinese America. Um, I hope some of you have visited our space, but we are one of the more undiscovered gems, I would say, of the city. So if you haven't, um, I'll share a little bit about our space and our programming, um, what we're doing now and what we were doing before and kind of how you can get roped in. Um, so we were founded in 1980 as just a project, Chinatown History Project. And most of our collections are really interesting in that um, they're not these, uh, fan we do have some artwork, but most of them are not these fancy artworks um, on the wall. They're ordinary objects from ordinary people whose stories weren't being told actively. And our two co-founders, Jack Chen and Charlie Lai, did a lot of oral histories and collecting in the neighborhood to kind of gather these stories that were um, under told and undershared um, and created our space. Um, it turned from a project into a museum when we tried to give all of that stuff to a lot of different other museums, but nobody at the time thought it was quite valuable enough. Although um, now, of course, times have changed and people do see the value of um, Asian American stories. Um, our exhibits chronicle um, Chinese American life and stories and lived experiences. And we're really a mix of art, culture, and history. So we have a, a core historical exhibition, which I'll show you a photo of later, but um, we also have a lot of rotating art exhibitions. Um, uh, with some renowned artists. So on the screen now on the left side, um, so both um, photographs that you can see on the screen are from our 1980s original collection when we were just a project. We hired a couple of photographers to go around Chinatown talking to people and taking their wow. photos. So on the left, you see um, a young man in a Ramones, um, donning a Ramones t-shirt, kind of posing for the camera. Um, and on the right, you see um, an older gentleman with his grandchild opening a newspaper and kind of having an, um, an endearing moment. Um, so these were really the Chinatown street scenes that um, we captured at the beginning of our days. Um, and I also on this slide have um, my email. So we're a really small team, but if you email education at mochanyc.org, that really goes directly to me. So any questions you have later, um, you can feel free to email there. And on social media, we're at Mocha NYC. Um, feel free to hop on to the next slide. So this is the interior of our core exhibition, if you haven't been. Um, it's called With a Single Step, Stories in the Making of America. So the museum is really, it's a museum for all, as our president says. It's not exclusively for Chinese Americans or Asian Americans, though, um, of course, we highlight those stories, but it's really, um, about, um, in large part, about the Chinese American experience and an immigrant experience that resonates across many groups. Um, so we welcome all into our space and um, to, to consider these stories in the making of America. Um, and this is our first room in the gallery. Um, and we'll go to the next slide and I'll show another space. 
Um, so this is a room called the Rising Spirit, and it talks really more about community life. Um, you can see an opera robe and a lion dance costume. Um, and really it has the festivity of Lunar New Year, uh, festive colors and um, all that um, buzzing excitement. Uh, and this is a room we use a lot for our programming, um, which I'll talk more about once we go to the next one. <laughs> so like many other institutions, we've pivoted to online programs, but I did want to give you a glimpse of what we did offer in person and what we hope to offer again really soon as soon as possible. Um, right now, we are still closed to the public. Um, the last bullet on this slide talks about the Windows for Chinatown exhibition. That is something you can actually do now if you're in Chinatown. While the physical space is not open, um, we have windows on all sides of the museum. So we have two whole streets, Center and Lafayette Street um, in Chinatown, and they are all great exhibition space. So we've just launched an exhibit called Windows for Chinatown. Um, so that um, really is a, it's a full on exhibition with um, many panels. Um, gives you insight into um, Chinese American life during um, the pandemic. So we have a new collection called the One World Collection that it highlights, but it also gives you insight into Chinatowns and the history of Chinatown, basically the place you would be standing or sitting when you are um, visiting um, the exhibition. So a little bit of history into um, Manhattan Chinatown and Sunset Park, and it's a really um, great exhibition. So if you are hankering to be outdoors, and wants to stop by, um, I highly recommend it. Um, other things we do on site, most of which are on pause, um, we do group gallery tours, and neighborhood walking tours. So you can be in our space, but also in Chinatown um, and learn a little bit more about um, the history of the streets. Um, and then um, we do a lot of family programs. Um, those are mostly online and I'll talk about them later if you are interested um, in an intergenerational experience with your loved ones. Um, and then uh, we have Reflections on the Everyday, which is our newest program, and it's a gallery program and art making experience, uh, specifically for Mandarin speakers with dementia and their care partners. Um, if we go to the next slide, I'll show you a little image of that and we can talk more about it. Great. Um, so we were so lucky enough to work with Meredith from Caring Kind, um, the Connect to Culture program, um, to help launch um, our newest program, Reflections on the Everyday, um, which in Chinese translates to everyday chit chat, um, which is really meant to be a really casual and intimate experience in our galleries. Um, we've, we were lucky enough to launch it once before the pandemic hit. So this is a lovely photo that you see of um, a small group sitting on stools in that rising spirit space. Um, above head you can't really see is the lion head and our educator Nora is guiding everyone through an experience. Um, they're looking at some photos and they're also, um, after that, they looked at a video of a lion dance and everyone kind of talked about Lunar New Year traditions. Um, this one was a program focused on holiday traditions and people's um, experiences celebrating and coming together with family. Um, on the next slide, you can see, um, so this is the art making component. So the program has two components, the in-gallery experience, which uses both our core gallery as well as any temporary exhibits we have, which rotate two times a year. Um, but then there's also a space and time for um, art making together. So this is a time where we also drink tea and eat snacks and kind of relax and chat. Um, but there's also um, a related art, hands-on art project. Um, and you get to work with a couple of our educators in this photo. Um, we're creating different trays of prosperity um, or trays of togetherness, which share, um, which are basically foods that you would eat and share that are really symbolic during the holiday time that you would share with your family. So everyone's making personalized um, collages of their trays and talking about why they selected what they selected. Um, so that's kind of a snapshot of our in-person programs. Sadly, we've not been able to transition this program online yet just because it is so new for us, but we hope to do so. And we also hope to offer it in Cantonese in the future. Um, on the next slide, I'll share a little bit about what we are doing online now. And then I will also share um, in the chat after a link to a document, which kind of links to all of the videos and all of the kind of resources and things you can do now from home. Um, so we, we do on our website have a video tour. So it's about a 20 minute tour of our With a Single Step Stories in the Making 
of America exhibition. So if you're not familiar with it, or if you want to kind of learn about the Chinese American experience, or you have 20 minutes on your hands and you want to hear a really fun story, um, it's really dynamic um, and animated, um, you can go to our website and I'll share that um, again um, in the chat afterwards. And we also have um, three different audio tours. So one in English, Mandarin, and Cantonese for the same exhibition. So um, it lets you kind of imagine that you're in the space and um, you can kind of uh, picture what's on the walls. Um, we also have a series of two magazines um, about um, some mocha heroes. They're um, famous Chinese Americans who people don't really know about as much as they should. And they're fun little magazines you can read online. We have one on Young Wing, the first graduate um, of first um, Chinese American college graduate in the state, as well as Chinese American railroad workers. Um, we also have um, Mocha Create at home videos. So in the museum, oops, I'm running over my time. In the museum, um, we did hands-on art making um, with families of all generations. So we have recorded videos, which you can watch online. And then um, we also have public programs on, um, on our website. So you can sign up or you can watch on our Vimeo um, recorded past ones in case you missed anything. Um, the last thing I want to bring up is our Listen with Mocha website. So we had an exhibition about music and um, which is an excellent way to connect with others. And we have um, playlists and songs online from that exhibition that um, are really fun to listen to. And I'll share the link for that, but you can basically listen to hours and hours of songs um, that are Chinese American classics or also American classics. Um, some stuff you'd be familiar with and some stuff you would not have heard about. Um, thanks so much. Great to meet you all. And I'll share that in the chat. Sorry for going over my time. Hello, everybody. My name is Ariel Weisberger, and I'm glad to see you all here today. And um, I am a music therapist with Berco Music Therapy. Um, we are a few, ther a few therapists now. And what we do is that uh, we provide home-based music therapy. We go to people's homes uh, for individual therapy and, and family therapy. And um, also we do drumming groups and therapy, music therapy groups with different organizations. Um, and um, we also do traditional uh, talk therapy. And, um, and we also work with children, by the way, who have uh, autism and other developmental uh, concerns. And, but one of our main specialties is to work with, with older adults um, uh, older adults who have Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's, uh, depression, anxiety, uh, grief, or just people who want to um, have more music in their lives and learn how, <clears throat> excuse me, learn how to use it to have a better quality of life. And uh, right now um, we're doing, we're still doing a, a few limited amount of home visits, taking all the precautions. Uh, necessary and then we're doing a lot of uh, virtual uh, sessions, virtual group sessions, uh, pre-recorded and live webinars and also working individually with people. Uh, and so as music therapists, we are musicians, right? And then we're also therapists. We, we also do talk therapy and then we have our specialization specifically on music therapy. And music therapy is um, a way of using music specifically to address therapeutic goals. Um, can you switch to the next slide, please? And so I'll tell you a little bit more about the goals, but first I want to talk briefly about music experiences. There's many type of different uh, music experiences, not that one is better than the other, they're all good. There's active versus receptive music. Receptive is when we're taking all the music in, listening. Right versus active music, invo active involvement in music, that's us either playing music or singing along or whatever it may be. And there is also recreational versus therapeutic. Recreational can be um, maybe singing in karaoke or going to a concert or watching a concert, like it's a way to pass time or learning how to play an instrument for fun. Uh, therapeutic experience is when we specifically use music to um, 
help us feel a little bit better. Maybe if we're going through a breakup or, or we want to think of a loved one and we're feeling a little bit sad, uh, we, want, we listen to music specifically to address that, specifically to feel a little bit better. And then there's therapy, music therapy, and music therapy, just like any other traditional therapist, is working with a board certified music therapist and having working with specific in a specific clinical treatment plan addressing specific goals. Hey, can you go to the next slide, please? And some of the goals that we work on in music therapy, especially with older adults, are uh, using specific music, uh, there's personalized music, music that uh, means something to the person that we're working with, so really work with all types of, of music, uh, to bring a, to a trigger certain memories, right, of, of people, certain important memories, to promote a positive changes in, in mood and emotional states, um, to feel like we have a sense of control in our lives, uh, even with something as simple as choosing uh, the music we want to listen to or, uh, or writing a song or changing our environment by putting some music, right, and having a successful experience. Um, we, another goal is to gain a little bit of awareness of ourselves, right, by talking about it or by, um, you know, by, by engaging with it and learning more how different music makes us feel. Right, uh, we work in. Uh, we use music to reduce anxiety and stress levels. Uh, is a way to uh, help manage pain, specifically when we when we focus uh, specifically on music. Right, sometimes our pain can go down by as a distraction from the pain. Um, uh, we work on music to stimulate. Uh, an interest in life. Some of our clients initially are a little bit depressed. They may not have as much interest interest in doing things, but uh, you know, music. It's it's hard to go against music sometimes, right? When we hear uh, a song or a music that means something to us, we cheer up um, usually. And um, to and also we create music based activities to uh, interact with others. Right uh, by playing the beat, singing along, sharing our responses, and to stimulate creativity and self-expression, and of course joy. Right. So the way we do this is that we play different instruments, and then depending on what our clients want to do, um, we uh, we help them learn to play instruments or to write songs or to choose songs, and it's all a personalized. Right. Uh, and there's no need to know how to play music at all before. Let's go to the next slide, please. This is a song that I wanted to do. I got rhythm. I love this song because it brings a awareness to the things that we have always with us, like music, like our loved ones, like rhythm. So especially now in a time where we may be missing a lot of these things, uh, you know, through a song like this, we can at least gain a sense of of empowerment. But I don't think I have time to go to do this song. Maybe if we do, we'll come back. So let's go to let's go to the next one. I think there's more music coming uh, through other organizations soon. Anyways, so here we just want to show you a few uh, pictures of some of the vir virtual groups we we'll we have been doing. Um, it's a different thing now. Um, doing this virtually is very different, of course, than being uh, live. And some of the things that we've been doing is we're using virtual backgrounds uh, to stimulate um, and to address some of these goals that I, I was talking about before. Here you see me playing along with <clears throat> uh, Doris Day. You see the autumn leaves. Um, so sometimes we have a theme uh, of, you know, it's like it's kind of like a musical journey. We have a theme of songs from movies and then we go uh, through we play different songs of movies with the pictures behind us uh, or, or different parts of America or different uh, seasons etc below you see um, you see me playing a pillow that's another thing that we've been doing um, playing a uh, using sounds using objects that we have at home right and in trying to make sounds out of it uh, also sometimes we put the lyrics 
uh, on the screen, as you see below with What a Beautiful Morning. There you have a, a shot there at the West End Music in the perception of the, I mean, the West End residents and uh, the perception of the, of the people how they see me on the TV. So it's a lot of fun and that's some of the things that we've been doing. And let's go to the past, the, to the last uh, slide, please. Uh, and there you see my information. I'll add it on the on the chat as well. Um, you know, if you have a, more questions about what music therapy is, if you need a referral, or um, if you want me to help you start your program, whatever it may be, uh, I'm happy to help. And you can contact me anytime. And thank you so much for having me. And uh, that's it. See you guys soon. Hi there. My name is Maggie Willems, and I work in the visitor experience department at the Rubin Museum of Art. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please, Gavin. Uh, in my role, I oversee the museum's accessibility initiatives, and I'm excited to talk to you today about a few of the programs that we are currently offering digitally. And we can move to the next slide, please. So the first program I'd like to talk to you about is called Mindful Connections. This program in its 10th season at the museum this year promotes engagement between works of art and adults suffering from dementia and Alzheimer's. This year, the programs are being held virtually via Zoom. Uh, the museum guides show photos of works from the Rubin Museum's collection and lead a discussion with participants on interpretation, history, and reflections on the art from their own life experiences. Sessions are one hour long and they're free with registration. And the second program that I want to tell you about today is called um, Empowering Caregivers. And this addresses the needs of those caring for adults suffering from dementia and Alzheimer's. We invite participants to examine the power dynamics in their lives and open their minds to a different understanding of their own agency. This program, also led by Ruben Docents, explores how contemporary and traditional Buddhist works of art can offer new perspectives and pathways to empowerment. Empowering Caregivers is free and takes place virtually on select Mondays this fall. If we can move to our next slide, Gavin, I just wanna tell you quickly what our very next event uh, is about. So it's this coming Monday, we have a session of empowering caregivers uh, and we are excited to welcome as a special guest, music and creative arts therapist, Liza Wu, who is going to lead a music composition exercise as part of the art discussion. So again, these programs are free um, and you simply register by emailing access at rubenmuseum.org or visiting rubenmuseum.org backslash events. Um, and I have those on a sl slide later too. Um, oh, on the next slide, actually. Yes, so registering by emailing us at access at rubenmuseum.org or by visiting our website, rubenmuseum.org slash events. So lastly, uh, I would like to invite you, we can move to the next slide here. I'd like to invite you to be part of an installation we currently have on view at the museum called The Lotus Effect. Uh, we've taken inspiration from a lotus, a sacred symbol associated with awakening and transformation that frequently appears in works of art at the museum. This installation, we've asked participants to fold origami lotuses and dedicate them to someone or something that supports them during these challenging times. You can take photos of your lotuses and share them with us on social media or simply place them in your home somewhere as a reminder of hope and resilience. Visual artist Utam Grandi, uh, who designed the origami lotus for our project, has provided easy step-by-step -step folding instructions for us to follow. Uh, so if you have a piece of paper handy, you're welcome to join in now 
or you can visit the Rubin Museum to participate whenever you're free. We have this video along with printable PDF instructions and instructions if you would like to share with us online. Um, so Gavin, I'll have you go ahead and start the video. Um, I will pause you about halfway through just to be mindful of time, um, but we can start. Sounds good. Let's begin. What I have in front of me is eight and a half by eight and a half pink colored paper, which looks identical on both the sides. Now to begin with, you make a diagonal fold by bringing this corner to the corner on the opposite side. Once you have a fold like this, unfold, and then you do the same thing where you bring this corner here to this corner here. Now I unfold. What you would see here is an X. Now you flip the paper and you bring this top edge to the bottom edge, thereby forming a crease in the middle. And what you would do is you simply unfold and you'll see there are two mountain folds which intersect a valley fold. And you would just try to see the intersection point and you try to pop it from the other side. And what we have here starts to look a little like a 3D shape. Now without creating any new creases, you try to collapse into a triangle. Now after the collapse, this is how it looks like. Now for the next step, you have to take one of the layers and you find here the middle point and you make a fold away from the center this is the center line and then you make a fold away from the center like this and now you take the opposite layer one and then you do exactly the same way you try to make it like a mirror image like this now the remaining two layers that you have this one and again you take this and now with this line as the reference you fold it away from it and if you try to match these two V's that appear, that is ideal. And now you do the same thing on the other side. And this marks the end of the first version of the Lotus. You can stop here and call this project done, or you can keep folding and make a more version of the Lotus. Okay, so I'll have us pause here then with Those, that first version. 
Uh, so you can, like you said, you can continue uh, to create a 3D Lotus um, and you can mail them into the museum or bring them in if you're in New York City um, and be a part of the installation on site. It's a really beautiful way of connecting. Um, I want to thank you all for, um, for your attention and time and thank you so much to the organizers uh, for having me. Um, you can find the entirety of this video and more information about our access programs on our website at www.rubinmuseum.org. Um, I can answer any questions if there are any. Um, if not, you can also write to me at access at rubinmuseum.org. So thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Jackie. I just wanted to say it was so soothing to watch that him create that lotus flower too. I, even though I wasn't, I didn't have any paper handy. I really enjoyed just watching. Um, but hi, everyone. My name is Jackie, and I am the founder of Sing for Your Seniors. We are a nonprofit organization that's based in New York City, but now, thanks to virtual times, um, we're we're kind of having um, you know bi coastal sessions and and able to reach more participants. Um, our organization um, brings professional performing artists from the Broadway community into senior centers and assisted living facilities. Um, to perform and engage. Um, but obviously now um, we are doing our programs virtually. We were uh, founded, this is our 15th year, so we're, we are so excited in August to celebrate uh, 15 years of, of music and um, creating those community connections. Um, you can find um, us online at singforyourseniors.org. There's a few resources there that I'll tell you a little bit about. Um, you can, um, we have a section for music resources that has um, some videos of some of our singers. We've created sort of a, a video session um, that you can play. We also have other resources from the musical theater community um, that you might want to share with your participants. Um, but primarily now that we've moved virtually, we have two kinds of um, sessions specifically that we do um, through the Zoom platform. Um, one of them is our group sessions, which we try to emulate to be very much like our, our usual uh, Sing for Your Senior sessions where there's about four um, professional performing artists that perform songs from um, Broadway, from the golden era of Broadway, from um, the Great American Songbook, and depending on your particular community and the kind of music that you do um, enjoy, uh, we provide pop music or rock music. Um, really our goal is to create relationships um, with your particular community. And the more that we um, have our sessions, the more we get to know what kind of music resonates with them. And that's the kind of music we want to use to make those connections. Um, depending on how your particular community is set up now, um, Sing for Your Seniors um, works with senior centers. And so those sessions tend to look like, um, you know, many different windows on the screen because we have participants that are, that are zooming in from their home homes um, where they're in isolation, maybe with family members or by themselves. Um, and then we also work with assisted living places where we might see a couple of people social distance with mask in a room and we'll be on a big screen. Um, or um, sometimes we are um, we, we are uh, televised through an in-house system. So sometimes we don't see our audience at all um, because we are being sent through their in-house system and they're, they're watching us in their individual apartments on their screen. And we work with the recreation directors to um, receive any questions that they might have or even re um, requests for music for the next time. And then another way um, that we love to, to do these sessions with our um, um, assisted living places is having family members also zoom in on those calls so that they can um, interact and engage with their family members who might be in isolation in the assisted living um, homes and um, have something to um, experience together. And then, um, as I mentioned at our meet and greet, then later that evening when they're on their phone call, they can 
um, you know, have something new to talk about. Um, and I have Maggie here with us. Um, she's one of our artists as well, our session leader. And um, Maggie participates with Sing for Your Seniors. She's, she's been with us for a long time, but Maggie also has the unique experience of participating in our Broadway sessions. And our Broadway sessions is when we partner with a particular Broadway show to bring the essence of that show to a center um, for folks who are unable to, you know, go to the theater, particularly now, none of us can go to the theater. So this is especially important now. <laughs> um, we have a lot of Broadway folks who are, you know, um, kind of scattered to the winds. Maggie's here in California with me. Um, but I'd love for Maggie, um, if you wanted to jump on and talk a little bit about your experience as a performing artist and um, particularly with your Broadway session. Yeah, it was really exciting. Um, I was on the Broadway tour of Les Miserables for about almost three years. Um, and I think we were in Colorado and we set up a session to go to a specific center. Um, and what what touched me and why I, we, I know that this program is so important, there was a woman there who loved Les Mis and her husband knew we were coming. So he came to sit with her during the performance and she goes, I was so sad that I was gonna miss seeing Les Mis coming this time. And so you guys coming here, we got to hear all of my favorite songs and then some others. And so that was just really special. We sing our normal songs, but we do get to sing songs from the show. And sometimes the people playing the parts come, sometimes the understudies go, which is really a really interesting vibe and thing to create. And so when we go, oh, well, I understudy this part or I do this, it definitely brings um, not just the show, but the people and the actors to our seniors to make that connection one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and luckily too, some of my cast members still now have participated and sung with us and we kind of had a Lee Miz themed one virtually, but it was really exciting to be able to bring um, Lee Miz to a group of people that might not have seen it before. Yes, and, and virtually as well, we've been able to work with Beautiful, the Carol King musical. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been able to collect cast from that as well. So I'd love to now um, share sort of what our Sing for Your Senior sessions are like um, between Maggie and I. I'm not sure who is um, working the um, screen, but I'd love to take the logo down so that Maggie and I can be um, larger for those folks who are wanting to there we go. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Absolutely. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so this first song I'm going to sing um, is from the musical The Sound of Music. Um, the show opened on Broadway in 1959, um, but some of y'all might remember the film, which was what I grew up with, uh, with Julie Andrews that opened in 1965. Um, so this is a wonderful example, and I know a lot of our session leaders like to start this way because we definitely get our participants singing along. My day in the hills has come to an end, I know. A star has come out to tell me it's time to go. But deep in the dark green shadows are voices that urge me to stay. So I pause and I wait and I listen For one more sound, for one more lovely thing That the hills might say The hills are alive with the sound of music With songs they have sung for a thousand years The hills fill my heart With the sound of music My heart wants to sing Every song it hears My heart wants to beat Like the wings of the birds That rise from the lake to the trees, 
my heart wants to sigh like a chime that flies from the church on a breeze to laugh like a brook as it trips and falls over stones on its way to sing through the night like a lark who is learning to pray. I go to the hills when my heart is lonely. I know I will hear what I heard before. My heart will be blessed with the sound of music and I'll sing once more. And on our virtual sessions, we do the ASL. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Applause. <laughs> All right. So Maggie has one more song for us to close out this incredible Artful Aging um, um, fair that we we're just so proud to be a part of today. Maggie, why don't you take it away with a beautiful message? Um, this is one of my favorite songs to sing, and I love to share this story with our seniors because it makes them feel like they're kind of part of the drama. Um, I'm about to do the song Summer Over the Rainbow, um, which is what I mean, it's such a classic song, but there is an introduction um, in the song that was cut from the film. So a lot of people don't know it, but it's my favorite thing to sing. And I um, workshopped the show with Andrew Lloyd Webber when he revived it in London. He's the guy that wrote Phantom and Cat. Um, and my friend was the director and when we were recording it of the new version um, my friend leaned into me and he goes Maggie what do you think do you have any notes and I Angela Weber was sitting right behind us and he leaned in and being the cheeky American that I am um, who's never <laughs> not used my own voice um, I go well you guys have cut out my favorite part of this song and I just don't think the song is as strong without it and lo and behold on the West End, it made it into the show. So I like to say that I told Angela Weber how to do his stuff. <laughs> um, so this is Summer Over the Rainbow. <laughs> when all the world is a hopeless jumble and the raindrops tumble all around, Heaven opens a magic lane <laughs> When all the clouds darken up the skyway There's a rainbow highway to be found Leading from your window pane to a place behind the sun, just a step beyond the rain. Somewhere over the rainbow, <laughs> way up high, there's a that I heard of once in a lullaby. Somewhere over the rainbow, skies are blue, and the dreams that you dare to dream really do come true. Someday I'll wish upon a star and wake up where the clouds are far behind me. Where troubles melt like lemon drops away above the chimney tops. That's where you'll find me somewhere. fly over the rainbow why then why can't 
I'm so grateful to be here to show you what Sing for Your Seniors does every week. <laughs> Thank you so much for that amazing performance. We really appreciated you and all the other fabulous uh, resources who spent this hour with us today. Um, I don't think there were any further questions, but um, we're here for a few more minutes. If anyone would like to say anything or Melissa, are you? Um... No, thank you. Oops, you're breaking So up. much for everyone and for all of, and for so for grateful all of these wonderful organizations for taking time from your day to join and share and for everyone for coming on today to be with us. We just, Words can't express how grateful we are to everyone. Hi, 305. Thanks for staying on with us today, our residents. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And thank Have you. Have a great for, day. For what a wonderful and way. And thank you, Jackie and team, for singing us out of such a rainy day and bringing, bringing a rainbow into our rainy day. We really appreciate it. It was fabulous. Thank you.